This conference uh, and will by now all be means, recorded. Any notes or any thoughts of questions to keep back for later? Martin, start going forward. Right, I'm just going to try to get onto the slides. If butterflies and moths are doing well, then our ecosystems should be in a reasonably good, healthy state. Uh, equally, of course, the opposite is also true. Uh, and sadly, as you probably guessed, uh, many of our butterflies are actually uh, finding it quite difficult and have done over the last sort of 20, 30 years in particular. Um, butterfly conservation is very much an evidence-based organization. We do run uh, some major recording schemes because we feel that if we have data, uh, then we can adopt a scientific approach. We can try to sort of work out exactly what is happening and then hopefully that'll inform what we can and can't do in terms of trying to help. Um, this map just shows uh, many of our regular transects that are walked on a weekly basis from uh, April right through to September. And um, there are a lot of them. I don't know what that means. Um, but certainly by recording uh, butterflies and moths, uh, hopefully then we can come up with uh, some solutions to the problems that are posed. Um, this graphic shows that uh, certainly since the 1970s, two thirds of our butterfly species are actually in decline. And I'm afraid the same situation is also true of our supposed, supposedly more common moths. Um, they're becoming less common. We can very broadly divide our butterflies into two groups, the so-called habitat specialists. These are the rarer ones that I'll be looking at in my second talk on uh, August the 31st, and it'd be great if you could join us then. Uh, today, we're going to concentrate on the wider countryside species. These are the more generalist species. They tend to be less uh, fussy, less particular. And, uh, and so can be found in a variety of habitats and are generally found throughout uh, much of Cumbria. Um, again, concentrating on the right hand of the screen, uh, you'll see the wider countryside species. Um, often the, uh, the caterpillars will perhaps have a range of food plants. They're more mobile, they're more adaptable to colonizing new areas. Quite a few of them have more than one brood a year. So examples would be, for example, the, the tortoiseshell and the peacock that uh, the caterpillars feed on nettles. Nettles are found widely throughout Cumbria and indeed throughout the UK. Um, listing them, uh, again, we'll focus mainly on the right-hand side, the wide countryside species. So we'll be looking in particular at things like small and large skipper, uh, orange tip, the white, the large white, the small white, the green vein white, the brimstone, um, speckled wood uh, and so on. The ones on the left side we'll again focus on in our second talk. Uh, looking at how they've been faring since the 1970s, um, the picture isn't completely clear in that it isn't a progressive up or downward curve as you can see. They're good years and bad years but if you look at the overall pattern over the last 30-40 years uh, you'll see that um, the wider countryside species are down, I'll just go back to that one, um, by quite a lot. Uh, these are the supposed common ones, but yet they're considerably down on where we started. Uh, the habitat species have suffered even more. And why, of course, uh, this begs the question, well, it's partly through habitat loss, um, increasing fragmentation and isolation, populations get isolated. Uh, degradation of the quality of habitat, um, 
and also global warming or climate change, perhaps I, I should say, but certainly uh, a rather amusing picture of uh, proof, if you needed proof, that global warming is a real issue. I think um, without explaining that, it's fairly self-explanatory. Um, but to, to be more scientific, uh, again, looking at the, the red line on this graph, you can see that, um, yes, they're warmer and colder years, but over a run of time, um, a big increase in temperature. And in fact, if you look at the graphic at the bottom from 1980 to 2000, you'll see temperatures really have surged ahead quite considerably over their historic past. Uh, to summarize this section, um, you know, what is going on? Well, we've got atmospheric pollution, uh, fossil fuels, car emissions, chemical pollutions, neonicotinoids are a worry, of course. We mentioned climate change, but in particular, wet summers, uh, sorry, wet uh, winters, mild wet winters, which encourages uh, excessive grass growth. Poor summers, although at the moment you certainly wouldn't think so. Um, certainly more extreme weather, and we've had plenty of that over the last few years but also changes of uh, land use um, and intensification in particular, mainly agricultural changes, removal of hedgerows, abandonment of land, and sometimes uh, either over-management or, or indeed lack of management or inappropriate management, uh, certainly when it comes to uh, biodiversity. Um, in particular, we can talk about in, in Cumbria, uh, the, the end of broadleaf woodland management, Coppicing, as you know, was a very important part of what happened to uh, managing woodlands, in particular in South Cumbia, the Morecambe area. And that, of course, has radically changed from the 1970s. Um, farming methods have changed. We mentioned climate um, reclamation, derelict and brownfield land, because some brownfield sites are actually very biodiverse, uh, but of course have been concreted over and tarmacked and, uh, and have disappeared. Um, when you, when you get a combination of factors like this, 0.6, you get genetic weakness uh, as populations become uh, perhaps more isolated from each other. Um, this uh, species recovery strategy that butterfly conservation are working on is to very much uh, try to assess what's happening, um, to diagnose what needs to be done and to test to see if that is going to cause if that's going to cause some response, um, manage that response, manage the habitat, and hopefully get to a position of sustainable management where you won't need perhaps quite so much intervention. Right, now, uh, focusing on our butterflies in, uh, in the Northwest, we are very lucky because we have about 40 species out of a UK population of 59 species, which is remarkable for an area so far north. In fact, it's the highest number of species uh, north of Oxfordshire. And, and these are certainly some of the more common species that um, I'm sure you've seen and we hope to see that are around us. Uh, we'll be focusing on individual species in a little while, but I thought this montage would just whet your appetite. These are some of the rarer ones that we'll be focusing on in our next talk on the 31st of August. And a few more rarities, because certainly Cumbria and Morecambe Bay in particular um, does uh, uh, is home to, to a number of very rare nationally important populations of these butterflies. Now, some species prefer rank grassland. And so when it comes to identifying species, um, first of all, we can rule out certain butterflies because we know that if we're in an area of rank grass, of tall grass, these species simply will not be there. They, they don't like, they really dislike very tall rank grass. Others, of course, and the ones I've pictured here, uh, do like it. So you can see we've got uh, a large skipper, which we'll look at at the top left of your screen. The marbled white below uh, isn't here, but we'll come on to that later. Uh, the gatekeeper going uh, anti-clockwise uh, likes taller grasses. The ringlet certainly does. Uh, and indeed, the, the small skipper. Um, others like damp grassland, but possibly not quite so rank. Uh, the ringlet is there again because the ringlet likes all damp grasses, um, medium to tall. Um, 
In the centre, we have um, the small pale bordered fritillary and the orange tip. Uh, the green vein white also loves damper areas. Whereas these ones, the limestone grassland ones, limestone, of course, gives usually very short turf and a much warmer microclimate and, and different varieties of grass, different species. Uh, and they support then, uh, they provide a different habitat and support a different range of butterflies. Uh, so these species here, the common blue, uh, again, going uh, anti-clockwise, the dingy skipper, the small heath and the northern brown argus, they're all butterflies that particularly like shorter grassland. So again, this helps us narrow down the possibilities when it comes to identification. Whereas on upland heath uh, areas, and we have a fantastic variety of different uh, habitats in Cumbria, we're more likely to see uh, small pearl bordered, um, small copper, small heath and green hair streak. Uh, peat bogs, large hair streak, Brownfield sites, um, we do get um, some uh, blues coming in, uh, dingy skippers, green hair streak again, uh, and the grayling. And also uh, one that has disappeared under my uh, screen. I can't see that last one. Um, moving on to the next. Uh, on unmanaged broadleaf woodland, we're more like to see holly blues, uh, speckled woods, white letter hair streaks purple hair streak and comma so these are unmanaged uh, broadleaf woodlands whereas on more managed sites we tend to find some of our rarities that we'll focus on uh, next time so a lot depends then on on the habitat uh, in terms of the sorts of butterflies that you're likely to see uh, of course butterflies that we usually think of in our mind's eye are, are the adults and we often forget that uh, through the year they started as an egg developing into a caterpillar a, a pupa and then only at a later stage uh, emerging as an adult and sometimes the adults can only be on the wing for just a, a week or two in other cases um, they can remain as adults for longer especially if they hibernate over winter but a lot of adult butterflies, the, the adult stage represents a relatively short part of their life cycle. Now, to, to learn about eggs, caterpillars and, and chrysalises or pupa um, is a little bit more demanding and much more sort of detailed uh, and, and perhaps um, time for a different, a different uh, program, a different talk at another date. Uh, so we, we will focus on, on the adults that are the ones that most people see and love. Having said that, um, this is the, the life stages of the brown hair streak, which can be found um, on our southern borders of Cumbria, the border of Cumbria and, uh, and Lancashire, almost certainly uh, reintroduced. It used to be here, we have historic records up to the 1930s, and then new records started uh, perhaps 15, 20 years ago. Uh, so it looks as if that's been uh, uh, released at some point. But it does show the eggs. You've got a close up of the egg. Um, you can see the pupil stage on the, uh, on the bottom right and the caterpillar above. Um, the caterpillar is very much the growing stage. Obviously, caterpillars are sort of eating machines. They spend most of their time uh, eating their favourite food plant. Sometimes the, the fussy ones will only eat one particular type of vegetation and none other. So that can be critical. Right, we're going to concentrate on the whites. It was only when I was looking at the, the whites a little earlier. And if you look in the top left, you'll see there's actually a spider. Um, it's a whitish spider, and I, I'm pretty sure it's there waiting for a, a whitish butterfly. It, it's sort of camouflaged. Whites are attracted to white things. Um, having said that, I suspect the spider was in hiding, uh, probably at the top of a uh, nectar source, a flower. Uh, the butterfly flies down, and then the spider very quickly will, uh, will grab hold and predate uh, on the butterfly. So certain spiders are very well adapted at predation of uh, butterflies and moths. Uh, 
But top left, we have um, a small white. And then uh, below that is a, a female orange tip without the orange tips because females don't have orange tips. The bottom right, we have um, a female brimstone. Uh, we then have a green vein white above it. And in the top center, um, a large white. Uh, it's a female because it has the big prominent spots. The males tend to have just the dark tips to the forewings. But these are all members of the, the white family and we're going to concentrate on, on those to start with. So here's uh, one of my favorites, uh, the brimstone. This is a male, so it's slightly more sulfurous, a bit more yellow, if you like, um, more showy. Um, one little butterfly, notice um, the shape to the wing, uh, very much like a leaf. The veins make it look even more like a leaf. When it shuts its forewing into its hind wing, it can camouflage itself amongst the foliage and it hibernates actually in foliage over winter trying to make itself uh, as least conspicuous as possible to any predator. Um, so a, a beautiful butterfly that will emerge often in March, having hibernated through the winter. And um, there is uh, a, a female, uh, sort of a pale, greeny, creamy color, um, but um, and a close up showing you the veins uh, to, to help disguise it as a leaf. And uh, the, the brimstone is found, well, not right across Cumbria, uh, but if you, if you see one in the south of Cumbria, you're probably not too far from its food plant, which is buckthorn and purging buckthorn. The, there's a caterpillar camouflaged on the leaf of a buckthorn uh, bottom left on your screen. Um, and uh, you'll see the graph shows its population is relatively stable uh, in Cumbria. And uh, there is actually an egg, if you can spot it, uh, in, in on the top right. But they will only lay eggs on buckthorn and purging buckthorn because that is their sole food plant. Fortunately, it's relatively widespread as a food plant in South Cumbria, much less widespread in North Cumbria. Although I believe they are little pockets. For example, some brimstones have been reported from near Carlisle. Um, the orange tip, this is the male with the orange tips. We said the female didn't have orange tips. So for every orange tip that you spot, uh, again, usually in April, it's not a hibernator, so it's freshly emerged from its pupa. Uh, for every orange tip you spot easily, um, there prob there's probably another that's a female that looks a little bit like a small white or a green vein white. But when, uh, when they settle, you can tell. Uh, but that's the male, a stunning butterfly, beautiful to see uh, in the springtime. Now, here's the female without the orange tips. You'll see it is sort of a gray tipped butterfly on the forewing, but they have this lovely mottling on the underside of the hind wing. And you can tell the time of year because uh, it's nectaring on bluebell. They do like uh, bluebell woods. They will go into woods. They'll also go on the edges of woods uh, and in slightly more open areas. In particular, you'll see them flying along country lanes uh, where there's plenty of hedgerow. What they're really looking for, of course, is their food plant. Certainly the females will be laying eggs. And you can see we have a male and a female and a female on the right uh, laying eggs on mayflower or cuckoo flower. They also like jack by the hedge. And you'll find both in meadows, uh, edges of meadows, edges of hedgerows, along country lanes, edges of woodlands. It's relatively common uh, and a wonderful butterfly. Uh, and the males are really striking. And I, I'm sure you've all seen them and uh, really enjoy seeing your first orange tip of the year. There's the female uh, looking more camouflaged because she's laying eggs and wants to be low profile. And uh, there's some jack by the hedge. And you can see how the caterpillars also are camouflaged. Um, incidentally, um, the, um, the female will often lay eggs singly because the caterpillars of this particular species are, are prone to being cannibalistic. And so the, um, the eggs do have to be uh, well spaced out. Uh, otherwise, um, 
there'll be far fewer emerging later in the year. Uh, there's latest smock, the other name for cuckoo flower or mayflower. Um, you can see a mating pair of, uh, of orange tips there. Right, the green vein white, quite often called a, a cabbage white, which it isn't. It doesn't usually uh, damage uh, brassicas, although it will feed on wild brassica. The, the brassica family is a, a large family, and it doesn't usually cause damage to uh, to allotments, unlike its uh, relatives, the small and the large white. But you can see the veins. Uh, why it's called green vein is a slight mystery. There's a there's a hint of green, but to me the the scales look much more sort of grey coloured. But when you look closely, a beautiful butterfly, and uh, with prominent veins on the inside when it opens up its wings. As I mentioned, they do like quite damp areas. They will be on the wing in the spring, and then they have a second brood. This is one of the commoner ones that does have second brood, and, and they're on the wing at the moment. So early um, in the year, um, sort of April, May, and then again, a bit of a break and, and then usually July and, and August and sometimes if the weather's nice into September and here's its close relative uh, the small white without those prominent uh, grey veins that we saw before again double brooded uh, this one certainly will come into gardens it will feed on nasturtiums if you want to protect um, any cabbages um, and similar plants, they will go on nasturtium instead. Uh, and there it is uh, feeding on knapweed. They take, uh, the, the, the adults obviously uh, extend their lifespan by taking nectar. They become starved of nectar, they become incredibly weak and floppy and actually after a short while they can hardly fly uh, and will then tend to starve to death. So in poor weather, they will sit tight and hope after a few days that things will pick up. If they can't take any sustenance, they'll then rapidly lose energy and be unable to fly. And if they haven't metered, then of course that means fewer butterflies for the next year. Uh, there is a shot um, on, looks like bird's foot trefoil. Now these are large, whites you can't really see the scale of this but they are quite a bit bigger i would say at least half as big again so in flight they usually can be distinguished from the other whites the male doesn't have those black spots that we mentioned earlier so the male is at the top with the black tips the white the uh, the female below with her wings closed if she opened them would have two black spots on each of those four wings. But they are significantly bigger. Um, and they're out at the moment, again, double brooded. So we, we saw them earlier on in the year uh, and now later on. Uh, another member of the white family, but one that we don't often see is the clouded yellow. Um, we have clouded yellow years when they will turn up almost anywhere in Cumbria. Most years, if we see one or two, that's probably all we're going to see. Just occasionally, perhaps every five, six, seven years, uh, there's a little bit of a migration in from the continent um, where they move up to Cumbria in low numbers. Certainly, they're much more common uh, in the south of the UK, but they're all migratory. They, they can't actually survive through uh, a typical British winter, although, of course, with climate change, there is evidence that they are possibly surviving along the south coast in some years. And there's another shot of the clouded yellow, a beautiful butterfly. It hardly ever, if ever, opens its wings. There are a number of butterflies that will always sit with their wings uh, shut, and so you have to be able to identify them uh, in that situation. Others, of course, love to, to open their wings, especially if it's sunny. Right, uh, moving on to an, another family. These are the Vanessids, um, our most colorful family. Big butterflies, brightly colored. A lot of them are nettle feeders, so the caterpillars will happily take nettle or, or thistle. And uh, certainly all of these 
are, are on the wing at the moment uh, in Cumbria. I've seen all in the last two or three days, and they're pretty much found throughout the county. Um, those that feed on nettles, these look like um, peacocks, they're often communal, so you'll get a group of caterpillars all huddling together. They'll stay in that uh, state until they're ready to pupate. And then uh, as they shed their skins, sometimes five, six or seven times as they grow, um, eventually they get to the point where they want to disperse to find uh, a, a site to pupate. But um, I have seen huddles of caterpillars like this on nettle at the moment, although a lot of them, of course, have now started to emerge from pupation. Uh, looking at the peacock first, um, these are winter, quite often in sheds, garages, barns, outbuildings, in your loft space. And you can see it's quite well camouflaged on the top left when it shuts its wings. It'll often blend in uh, and sit there throughout the winter. So it might be on the wing. Um, it's certainly on the wing at the moment. It'll stay on the wing while the weather's nice. But in fact, the peacock does go into hibernation a little earlier than most of the others. And uh, it will then find a place to hibernate that it thinks it's safe and dry and away from predation they'll often roost communally like this well i shouldn't say roost they'll often hibernate communally so you can actually come across 10 20 or 30 sometimes uh, all together in a suitable place and they'll stay like that probably right through till march you can see the caterpillars in more detail the the wonderful eye spots on the peacock really make it stand out and they are a, like a warning sign to try to uh, ward off a possible bird attack. So if it's sitting with its wings shut, it will flash them open. If they're already open, it will flash shut and open. The idea being that um, A, the bird will be surprised and B, uh, it will be deceived uh, and will peck at the wing spot, at the eye spots. Um, now a peck, uh, removing a little bit of wing will probably not damage the butterfly too much and uh, it should get away and be able to fly um, and so that uh, that's a survival technique against that type of predation but a stunning butterfly and you can see one there on buddleia they they love buddleias so you'll often find them coming into your garden and of course if there's a nettle patch not too far and there probably isn't it's well worth looking looking for caterpillars and the small tortoiseshell uh, has a similar lifestyle, a widespread species, although its population does fluctuate sometimes. We have had years where the numbers have gone right down, but it's another nettle feeder uh, and one that loves coming to gardens to nectar on buddleia, but all sorts of other flowers at this time of year. In fact, they'll often prefer gardens because, uh, especially late summer, um, many people have plants like asters and sedums that flower late in the year uh, and the butterflies actually find more nectar in a garden than often elsewhere and of course they're trying to build up their reserves in September and October to get through the hibernation period. They, they will lose a lot of their body weight uh, over the year and of course if they haven't got enough energy on board they, they can starve. Uh, another view of, of a, uh, a tortoiseshell, um, the video coming up, in fact, uh, we can't do that on this system. And uh, there it's, there's its close uh, relative, the Red Admiral, another stunning Vanessid butterfly. And now this one is a, mainly a migratory butterfly. And so again, we have good years and less good years, depending on the migration. Having said that, um, they can be seen in Cumbria every year and quite often in very good numbers. Certainly last year, there was a, a very good uh, population of uh, Red Admiral. Um, and once more, they, they love coming into gardens and feeding on, on uh, Buddleia. But they are found throughout Cumbria. They're a big, strong, powerful butterfly, can cover uh, a long distance. Uh, some of them, of course, have come in all the way from, uh, from the Mediterranean and from Central Europe. So they are used to traveling considerable distances. Uh, there's one feeding on, on Aster. 
Uh, when it shuts its wings, it has beautiful markings on the underside, sitting on a white buddleia. And here's its close relative, the comma. This one's on hemp agrimony. So we're talking now about uh, July, going into early August when the hemp agrimony is out. One of their favorite nectar sources. The ragged nature of the wing is absolutely natural. Um, that's how they emerge. So they, they, it's the only butterfly that has this pretty amazing profile to its uh, forewing and its hind wing. So that hasn't been pecked by birds. Uh, that's exactly as it comes. And when they shut up, you can see why they're called commas, the little white C. Um, without that white C, it's almost not a comma. I mean, it's a very distinctive butterfly to identify with the ragged edge and the, and the, and the comma. Uh, a beautiful butterfly, as you can see in close up. And here are the life stages of the, uh, the comma. Uh, so um, we've got the adult butterfly at the bottom and the caterpillar top right um, getting larger and then just going into pupation where it sheds its caterpillar skin for the last time and becomes a pupa. Um, in the pupa stage, some butterflies stay in the pupa stage over winter. Uh, others can be in a pupa stage for just a matter of uh, two weeks which I always find remarkable that the butterfly um, can metamorphose from a caterpillar to a pupa and then just two weeks later uh, become an adult. Um, so that pupa stage varies very much from butterfly to butterfly. So just on, butter, on caterpillars, their task is to, is to be the feeder nearly all the feeding takes place the the butterflies really just take uh, nectar to give them energy to keep going to make sure that they have time to cope with nature's vagaries in terms of weather uh, and time then to find a mate and to uh, and to breed and then for the uh, the female to find suitable sites to lay eggs once they've mated once the female has laid eggs, uh, many of them, apart from those that hibernate, um, don't live long. The, the comma is one that hibernates. Uh, so you do see that in the springtime, and then the second generation is out, uh, is out now. Well, it's really the, the next generation, I should say, because the ones that are on the wing at the moment are gonna fly around, they'll come into your garden, and then they'll hibernate through the winter and will fly right through until, um, perhaps May, sometimes even early June, but certainly uh, a good time to look for the the new ones, uh, the ones that recently emerged from hibernation, I should say. Um, they, they will be on the wing um, late March and definitely April and, and early May in particular. Now, the Painted Lady and the Camwell Beauty are also members of this family. Um, the Painted Lady is a migrant and uh, we have very good painted lady years like last year where literally tens of thousands of painted ladies were recorded all over Cumbria. I would imagine that Cumbria probably received population of, of a million plus, but it's impossible to put a figure on it. But uh, huge numbers uh, came to, to the UK and many of them went right up to Scotland uh, and up to Iceland and Scandinavia. This year, very few have come and I've only seen two or three. But again, keep a look out. They will come into gardens. They do love Buddleia. The Camwell Beauty, on the other hand, is an exceptionally rare migrant. And even in a good year, we're lucky if we get one or two sightings in Cumbria. Most years, no sightings at all. They're a very, very big, beautiful butterfly, but um, sadly, a very rare migrant. So there's the painted lady, and I'm sure you, you saw lots and lots of these beautiful butterflies last year. They, they come in from, uh, from North Africa and from the Mediterranean. There's a painted lady with its wings shut. Now, um, we shouldn't forget butterflies in urban settings. I think I've mentioned that, uh, especially later on in the year, gardens can be wonderful. But so can brownfield sites, abandoned sites, old building sites, 
quite often they're covered in buddleia, but also uh, other flowering sources of nectar. And butterflies are looking for nectar at this time. So do look out, especially if you have gardens with flowering ivy, um, if people have planted verbena, which you might know, uh, verbena bonarensis is a tall plant with small purple flowers that butterflies find very attractive. Um, if you prune your buddleia, you might get a second flowering, or if it's in a slightly more shaded spot, it might flower later. Uh, but do go into urban areas looking looking for butterflies, especially at that time. Um, and it's surprising what you can find. I mean, these are some results from Lancaster and Kendall. And you can see um, on one day, uh, a total of 95 butterflies were seen. And on another day, this is the 1st of uh, October, 207 butterflies with huge numbers of red admiral and tortoiseshell in particular. So uh, that time of year um, is a great time to go urban butterfly spotting. We have had some new arrivals in Cumbria. Um, the comma I've mentioned actually didn't used to be a Cumbrian species. So in the top left, you can see the comma. And that only moved into Cumbria uh, perhaps 20, 25 years ago. And it's now spread right through Cumbria, up into Scotland, and it's still spreading north uh, through Scotland. Um, bottom left, you've got uh, the gatekeeper, sometimes called the hedge brown. Uh, that's also spread. Bottom uh, right, the small skipper arrived in Cumbria in the year 2000 and is now found throughout Cumbria. Ringlet has spread greatly over the last uh, 20 years. And the speckled wood, again, is a new Cumbrian species. It's been here about 20, 25 years, but prior to that was exceptionally rare. Now very common. And a lot of this is due to climate change. Uh, you can see how the orange spots show the uh, the comma has spread north uh, and indeed the orange uh, the orange tip again the purple spots indicate where it used to be and the new squares show it moving up through lancashire you can see cumbria and right up into scotland it's almost got up to the north of scotland so it's great to see an expansion of the range of some species but of course, while some species have benefited from climate change, uh, it's sadly true that others have done the opposite. And it, it's mainly our rarer species that have suffered through climate change. And that's something we'll, we'll pick up more uh, in, the, in the next talk. Right, the brown family we'll move on to. And this is one of those that's arrived over the last 20, 25 years, the speckled wood. Slightly unusual in that um, it uh, overwinters in two different states. Some of them overwinter as pupa, and they emerge as uh, adults uh, in uh, early April, uh, the first sort of really warm days of April, and they're on the wing. Uh, others, though, overwinter um, as caterpillars, and so they've got to go through the pupa stage, and they will emerge a little bit later. And also this butterfly has two broods. So given that um, it's staggered anyway, and then you add, add into that, that they're two broods, the speckle wood is one of those butterflies you can actually see pretty much every month, all the way from early April, right through into September, sometimes even into October. It loves, it's well named because it loves woodlands. Uh, it loves open glades and rides where the light can get through and especially where there's apple sunlight and you'll see that's reflected and it's it's patterning on its wings so it'll often bask on the edge of a wood or in a woodland glade where there's dappled sunlight uh, and it just sort of melts into the dappled light which is i think uh it's pattern really isn't it with those lovely little yellow patches all over it um, the meadow brown, another member of the brown family. This is a female, which is slightly larger and has slightly more prominent uh, orange patches on its forewings. It is a bigger butterfly than the speckle wood. Certainly the female is. It's a fairly medium to large butterfly. Another grass feeder. They both feed on grasses. 
Now, again, it's quite well named because they certainly prefer meadows to woods. They will be found along the edge of woods, but not so often in woods, certainly if the canopy is well closed and there's not a lot of light. Where you get significant clearings in a woods, they will be found, but they, they otherwise like country lanes and meadows, more open habitats along woodland edges. It's just quite a common species and it's found throughout Cumbria. Um, and it will occasionally come into your garden if you live in a more rural location. Here's a male and a female uh, mating. The, uh, the female is the slightly larger of the two in this case. That's not always the case. Um, and so that's uh, the one uh, on, the, uh, on the top side and the male uh, below. Uh, the ringlet is, again, a species that's moved in with all this grass growth, with the, the amount of the mild, wet winters we mentioned and the excessive grass growth. They feed on grasses. They like, we mentioned, medium and tall grasses, quite rank grasses, so they're very happy here, uh, and they're now found throughout Cumbria because they've certainly spread a lot over the last 20 years. In fact, if you look at the graph, um, in South Cumbria they were hardly seen at all, and now they can often be the commonest butterfly. You see they're quite well named with, with rings, so hence the ringlet, although the bottom left picture shows a variant, an aberration, where the rings are much, much less obvious. That does happen from time to time. I mean, 95% will have rings as in the top pictures, uh, but occasionally you, you get these aberrations. And there's a pair uh, mating. Um, and they're found, say, throughout Cumbria, and they're, they're, They've just about gone over now. They were on the wing until perhaps a week ago or so, although in some cooler, shadier areas, perhaps some higher elevation sites where the weather is a little later, should we say, to arrive, then there might still be a few about. But as they get older, they lose their scales and become much more faded, whereas photographs tend to be showing them in a rather brighter, fresher state. That one is uh, one with an aberration again, uh, just showing it because it's unusual to see them like that, but it's well worth looking out for it. And that's uh, with its wings open. And that again is an aberration with no rings. So uh, my friend uh, Steve calls that a ringless rather than a ringlet. The gatekeeper, another one that's spread and done very well over the last uh, 20 years in particular, especially the last 10 to 15 years. Um, it's smaller than a meadow brown, a um, little bit like a female meadow brown, but it has more uh, orange. You can see especially the female has significantly more orange when it opens its wings. The bottom left is an aberration with a pale patch, but again, that's quite a rare aberration. And the graph shows a significant increase. Again, a grass feeder, and most grass feeders have actually done very well. There, there is a, a male uh, ringlet at rest. They're, they're out at the, uh, sorry, um, gatekeeper at rest. They're out at the moment. It's one of those that emerges quite late in the year. And uh, it's, if you haven't seen one um, and you go out into the countryside along many hedgerows, especially where there's perhaps a bit of late flowering bramble, they do seem to love gathering around um, a hedge that has a lot of flowering bramble, although the bramble is going over now. And that's just a close up uh, of when it has its wings closed. And another shot there resting um, on golden, not golden rod, um, it's, uh, oh dear, the, the yellow uh, flower that we're told we have to pull up and the name escapes me for the moment. Um, right, small heath. Uh, small heath is a bit of a Cumbrian speciality because nationally um, its numbers are down, but in Cumbria we have good populations, it's widely spread, and it's one of those butterflies that likes more open heathland areas and moorland areas, and can be found at quite high elevations. I know people who often go up looking for mountain ringlets high up in the highest mountains say they sometimes find quite large numbers of small heath that are surprisingly high elevation. It's quite a small butterfly, again, another grass feeder, 
and uh, it's doing well in Cumbria. Um, they're, they're out now, but towards the end of their flight season. And here are a mating pair of small heath. And this is a relative, the, uh, the grayling, um, which is remarkably well camouflaged when it shuts its wings down, which it does pretty much every time it lands. Uh, and it hardly ever opens its wings. Um, it likes to sort of melt away into the background by sitting on either bare earth or sand dunes or on rock, in particular limestone, where it's particularly well camouflaged. It has a rather rapid flight when disturbed, usually flying low over the ground and then dropping down suddenly. Sudden, uh, suddenly. And if you walk up to where it landed, it's often almost impossible to detect until you get too close and it sort of shoots up again. But a uh, remarkable butterfly in terms of its camouflage. And there's a mating pair. Uh, skippers again have uh, moved in and done very well. The large skipper has actually been here for a long time, but uh, that's on the left. Uh, the small skipper, on the other hand, is a relatively new butterfly and really has expanded its range right over Cumbria. You can see the difference. The, the large skipper is significantly larger. The photo doesn't really show that, but it is significantly larger. One thing that is clear on the photograph is that the, the markings are much more prominent. It does have a mottled patterning. Um, the male has the male is on the right and has that distinctive black bar that you can see that's more prominent. Um, and uh, the veins are much more prominent. Whereas on the, on the right, the small skipper, again, that's a male with a black bar, but you'll see the patterning and the veining is much, much less prominent. Um, and they can look quite uniform in color, especially the females. So they are smaller uh, and there certainly is a difference when you compare them like this. The large, skipper also emerges earlier so they will emerge um, in woodlands or woodland edges um, in open glades it's not a true woodland butterfly but they do like woodland settings so where you've got wide rides um, wide glades clearings edges of woods um, scrubby habitat then uh, they're often found from early June, really right through to the end of July. So June and July, whereas the small skipper, uh, like slightly shorter turf, slightly warmer environments, a little bit less shady, a bit more open, but it also emerges a little bit later. Uh, so that's just about on the wing still, but they particularly fly through July um late late june but july is their main flight period and they will fly into august uh, perhaps even to mid or late august in some locations there's a close-up of the large skipper with the the more patterned markings on the wings uh, whereas the small skipper there's a mating pair uh, without that marking And there's a small skipper, again, uh, without the prominent marks, apart from this one single black marking. You can't see it so well on the right, but it's there. Um, and that shows it's a male. The, the females tend to lack that. There's the female. Um, not to be confused with the Essex skipper, which is not actually difficult, because although they look incredibly similar, uh, the small skippers in Cumbria are almost certainly all uh, small skipper and not Essex skipper. Um, whereas in other parts of the UK, uh, it's very, very difficult to tell, apart from looking at the tips of the antenna. Uh, the Essex skipper, uh, it looks as if its wing, its, its uh, antenna tips have been dipped in soot. Um, so just the lower part of the antenna tip, not even the top, but just the underneath part, has this very black shiny appearance other than that they look almost identical so some people in other parts of the uk really do struggle to tell them apart whereas um, in cumbria uh, 
it's unlikely that the Essex skipper has arrived. It might do in the future, and it is possible it's here, but certainly all the evidence suggests that the skippers we have are, are small rather than Essex. Here's the common blue. Uh, the male, which is, as you can see, almost totally blue, beautiful bunny, a very fresh example, so it has a lovely white frilly edge. With time, they tend to lose that white edge a little bit. It tends to get uh, battered off as they age. And here's a female, um, much, much more brown, with a hint of blue around the body in particular. And you can see some blue scales, but most females are predominantly brown. Having said that, this is one of the butterflies that does show a lot of aberration, a lot of variant, in particular the female. So this actually, although it's mainly blue, um, is is actually a female. Um, and that is as well. And that's a remarkable uh, example uh, where you'll see the right side is male and the left side looks female. Um, quite what that is, I, I wouldn't really like to say, but I've never seen one like that. Uh, this was a photo given to me and uh, it's exceptionally unusual. And there is it uh, with its wings closed, uh, a, a beautiful a butterfly sitting on, um, kid, uh, not kidney vetch, um, birds for trefoil. Uh, which is their main food plant. So the female will lay eggs on the buds of, uh, of bird's foot trefoil, which again is a, a short turf species, one of those that likes warmer sites, often on limestone areas or short turf areas. They, they won't like rank grasses at all. There are actually three sitting on there. When I first looked at this, I thought there were two, but you can see there's two males with a bit more blue about their body but uh, on the left side is the female that's slightly browner and doesn't uh, have so much blue uh, close to the body but um, these are all common blue roosting they often roost colonially uh, in, in a colonial way uh, on um, grass uh, stems in particular on the sea heads and sometimes you can find 10, 20, 30, 40, all roosting in these areas. It's quite a common feature of blues to do that. So they'll perhaps be flying during the day, they'll settle down in the late afternoon and stay like that overnight. Uh, and then once it gets warm and the sun gets going, then they warm up and off they go again the next day. Um, the holly blue will come into gardens. You can see it's very silvery blue on the underneath side. Um, and as the name suggests, they're often found in association with holly bushes. So a lot of people have holly. The other food plant is ivy. They will only eat holly and ivy. Uh, but many gardens and urban areas uh, have lots of holly and ivy. And so you will find them coming into gardens. It's a beautiful butterfly to see, especially in April when it starts to emerge. There is a second brood later. Um, that's another one on uh, holly. And there it is with its wings shut. And another favorite related to the blues uh, is the copper, the small copper. It's in the sort of same genetic family as the blues, although you see there's, there's very little blue on that. Although some of them actually do have a blue tinge, especially near the body. But it's this wonderful coppery color um, it's quite widespread throughout Cumbria, uh, but in low numbers. So if you see one, it probably will be just one. You very rarely get lots of them occurring, although they can do, especially in the north of Cumbria, on some of the mosses, uh, like Drumbra moss, Glasson moss, and so on, where you can see, you know, especially second brood, which would be about now, uh, and going into even uh, September, you, you can see quite reasonable numbers at that time. Stunning butterfly, beautiful, uh, beautiful colors. And the, the plant I couldn't think of before is ragwort, and they do love sitting on ragwort. Again, uh, the underneath side. Now, the, the, the green hair streak is another small butterfly 
uh, this particular one very distinctive because it's the only butterfly that has this very special green color. In fact, inside it's all brown, but um, it never opens its wings. It always lands and shuts its wings straight away and they remain shut until it takes off. And it's again a camouflage thing. Uh, they will often sit on um, plants when they're not nectaring. They'll just rest on, on plants where there's lots of foliage. And of course, the green color, they just merge into the foliage. In flight, they actually look brown. It's a small butterfly um, and it emerges in the spring. Um, in warmer sites, it can be out as early as late March, early April. In higher elevations, it's more likely to emerge uh, at the end of uh, April or even May. Um, and in particular, it loves bilberry. The caterpillars feed on bilberry, not the adult butterfly. Uh, but where you have a lot of bilberry, um, you can get really big colonies of green hair streak. And if you're in the right place at the right time, where there's lots of bilberry, you can literally find hundreds of, uh, of green hair streak which is quite a sight. They don't usually come into gardens. It is uh, a, a butterfly that's found in, in quite wild areas where well bilberry is growing. You can see why it's called a hair streak. It's got that streak. All the hair streaks have a streak running through like that. That's sharp so well, but it's just a little bit worn, but it's there. And there it is. Again, a beautiful butterfly, the green hair streak. Now, just digressing for a moment, we, we run a whole range of uh, guided walks. Sadly, this year with COVID-19, that hasn't happened, but this is a, a previous program and hopefully next year, we'll try to get back to normal. And all these butterflies I've shown you are on these walks. So if you uh, if you like to come, just go on the Cumbria Butterfly Conservation website, uh, quite a few of our walks are to um, nature reserves, and some of the nature reserves are, of course, Cumbria Wildlife Trust reserves. There's some cracking Cumbria Wildlife Trust nature reserves right across Cumbria that have a lot of butterflies. I was working out that I think of the 40 species that we have, Cumbria Wildlife Trust reserves have 36 actually on their reserves. And there's only four that you have to go elsewhere to see. But we do try to have a range of uh, guided walks from April right through to uh, August. And uh, we try to see as many different species as we can. And these are our nature reserves because butterfly conservation does actually own or manage a number of reserves across the UK. The only one near here is uh, Myers Allotment, which is next to Silverdale Golf Course. And uh, we also are very active in what we call our landscape scale conservation sites. These are our key butterfly areas. And you'll see that Cumbria has been pretty much shaded green throughout and South Cumbria, a darker shade because it is a, a high priority area because it is such an important location for butterflies. And these are our work parties. We have lots of uh, work parties to try to improve the, the habitat for these butterflies. You're very welcome to come and join us. We're hoping to start in September, although of course with COVID, we are limited to the numbers of people that can attend. We work very closely with Cumbria Wildlife Trust. They have a whole range of fantastic work parties too. A lot of our members go on both the butterfly conservation ones and the Cumbria Wildlife Trust ones. Um, and uh, certainly they, they should be starting up, but clearly under limited conditions. You know, we'll be limited to the numbers numbers of people that can attend. Tools have got to be sanitized, etc., social distancing, and so on. But I know all these conservation bodies are trying to open up under the health and safety guidance that we have, uh, because it'd be a shame if we couldn't continue to manage for these species. So here's another work party and the sort of work we do. Uh, we produce lots of reports uh, based on all the data that we've collected. Gardening obviously is important if we can uh, make our gardens more butterfly friendly, not just by having nectar sources, but as I've indicated by growing caterpillar food plants, that's also very important. 
Um, and if you uh, click on Cumbria butterflies or Lancashire butterflies, there's a lot more information there available. So take a great leap forward, it says. Uh, join Butterfly Conservation. I'm sure you're all members of Cumbria Wildlife Trust already. Uh, take part in our work parties, in Cumbria Wildlife Trust work parties. Come on our field trips. Visit lots of fantastic reserves. We're really lucky to have so many wonderful places to see nature in Cumbria. We're really spoilt. I used to live, most of my life, I've lived in the south of England. And coming up to Cumbria has been a revelation in terms of all this wonderful nature that's on our doorstep. Um, partnership work's important. We work with all these <clears throat> different organisations. Many of them are trying to do exactly what we're doing. So we've recorded 40 species um, in the last 10 years. Obviously, we want to keep it that way. And we'll certainly do our best to see that all these wonderful butterflies and moths in this picture and this montage carry on flourishing. Now, that actually concludes the presentation, but I'm very happy to take questions. I'm going to have to ask my friend Martin, who's with me, to use his phone because for some reason the technology is such that I won't be able to hear questions uh, over the uh, over the computer, but I can obviously on on the telephone, and then I'll answer, be very happy to answer questions. So if you just allow me uh, a minute's pause uh, while I get the telephone sorted, then I'll be very happy to take questions. Martin. Hello, everybody. Um... So a quick word while Chris is getting his phone sorted. Uh, in the chat box, please add your question. But also I'm adding a link to a survey. Um, this is a survey that helps us gather feedback so we can have more of these presentations and more yeah, events. Yeah. So please click on the survey monkey. It'll take you about five minutes to fill in. Your help in this would be much appreciated. And if you've got any questions, um, add it to the chat bar as well. Hi, uh, I, I'm talking to Lucy, and I'm very happy to take questions, Lucy. Right. Well, it's a good. It's a good question. Um, if I talk through the computer, hopefully, hopefully people can hear me. Uh, right, thank you for that question about neonicotinoids. Um, it is a big worry because they're much more widespread. They're certainly, sadly, not banned. Uh, for example, Hello? people buy Hello? a uh, flea uh, spray Hello? or flea treatment that Lucy? for their dog or can cat. You hear me? The chances are it does contain neonicotinoids. Hello? And then when people wash uh, their dog, for example, and uh, the Hello? neonicotinoids get into the water, the water gets into the ground. Uh, can gets I speak to Lucy? And so actually, although that sounds relatively insignificant, it isn't. Just one uh, small dosage of dog treatment, flea treatment, can actually cause massive damage and pollution of our water with neonicotinoids getting you know over a wide area and that's going on all the time uh, sadly also we import uh, plants which are sold in many garden centers that have been treated with neonicotinoids uh, and again that gets back into the soil uh, and it's certainly shown the studies that we have that neonicotinoids do affect butterflies moths bees hoverflies you know, all, all these insects are definitely harmed by, I'm afraid, the growing menace of neonicotinoids. So that, that is a problem, and I, I wish there was uh, an easy solution. But we have to keep on telling those in charge of these matters that they need to do more, because certainly what's happening now is not dealing with the situation, is not dealing with the problem at all. OK, thank you. Chris, we've got another one oh, saying, um, why are there many more surveys carried out in the south than there are in the north? Why are more surveys carried out? 
yeah. in the north than the south. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, right. A second question. Um, why are surveys so unevenly distributed? And they are across the UK and they are actually within Cumbria. And it's a very good point. Um, it, it largely follows the demographics, the population. I mean, I, I absolutely love, love it when people say, look, uh, I'll do a transect, which is a weekly walk um, in, in a part of Cumbria that perhaps hasn't been surveyed before. There's something called the wider countryside scheme. And if people contact um, me, um, I'll pass their details on to Martin Chadwick, who's in charge of our wider countryside scheme. And he, again, would be delighted to have people monitoring and recording butterflies. It needn't be on a weekly basis. It could be just as little as twice a year. Uh, but in areas that aren't regularly monitored, because the, uh, the question is absolutely right. There are large parts of Cumbria that are very, very poorly recorded. They tend to be the more isolated areas, the least populated, the most mountainous, the most inaccessible. But having said that, there are plenty of areas where people can monitor, and we'd love to see people record butterflies and moths in those areas. Uh, and that would greatly improve our understanding of what's going on in Cumbria. And that's true throughout the UK. You know, when you look at a map of distribution of recording, it really does reflect population centers. And that's not good because clearly we're not getting a full picture of what's going on across the country or across the county if we're talking about Cumbria. So the more people we can get involved in, in covering other areas, the, the better it will be. Thank you for that question. Uh, next question. Next is, can Hi. you recommend a good recognition book for a beginner? Good books, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, a question about uh, books. Um, a really, really good book for a beginner on butterflies, and I'd love you to see it, but I don't think you can on the camera. Um, I'm holding it in my hand. It's called Britain's Butterflies, a field guide to the butterflies of Britain and Ireland, and it's published by Wild Guides. And the authors are David Newland and Robert Still are the lead authors. Um, and it's a wonderful photographic guide. It goes through every species with photographs, not just of the butterflies, but with their wings shut, with their wings open. You can see the caterpillars, the pupa, the eggs, the food plants, all beautifully photographed. Um, so it, and it gives you a distribution maps. It tells you when they are caterpillars, when they are pupas, and so on. And it tells you the best places to see them. Now, that is for the UK, it's not for Cumbria, and sadly there isn't an equivalent for Cumbria. But that's a, a great buy, it's inexpensive, it usually comes with a plastic jacket, so you can take it out into the field, carry it around with you. If you want a really, really fantastic book to refer to when you get back home, you, you wouldn't carry it around, but there is a wonderful book uh, by Jeremy Thomas and Richard Lewingdon, uh, that's called The Butterflies of Britain and Ireland. Um, you can get old editions secondhand quite cheaply. If you buy their new edition, it is expensive. Yes. It will probably cost you about £30. But it's a, a wonderful hardback um, book. Richard Lewingdon, uh, his paintings, and they are paintings, not photographs, but they're so good. I, I've never seen anything like it. They are stunningly good. And Jeremy Thomas, his uh, text is very authoritative, very clear, very concise, Hello. very well written. Is it so possible for anyone to hear me? Really, really good books, I recommend. I have. Right, any more questions, Bring please? And then somebody will take Hi. Yeah. Well, so are butterflies equally important for to, Apparently, we've got to use the telephone to, to um, are butterflies equally communicate. Right. Equally what, sorry? Are uh, butterflies equally important pollinators than bees? Ah, excellent. Right, uh, a question um, about pollination. Um, yeah, research has shown that bees are particularly important as pollinators, but uh, I must admit the press, which is great, and, and it's important that the press keep reminding folk about the importance of bees, because, you know, we are worried about our bee populations. 
and especially neonicotinoids is a big issue for bee populations. But bees pollinate perhaps 70% of all the pollination that takes place. Uh, but moths are probably next most important pollinators uh, with about a 20% pollination uh, and butterflies slightly less at more like about 10%. So those three actually are the most important pollinators, bees, uh, moths and butterflies. But certainly bees are, are very, very special and very important. But I think the, the contribution that moths and butterflies make you know, mustn't be overlooked, and it often is, it's often forgotten about, that they are very important pollinators. Uh, and pollination is a key thing that people quite rightly are getting worried about, because if there's less pollination, then that, that can seriously threaten our, our future food supplies. Right, um, any more questions? Yeah, um, Tony asks, can we get any identification charts to download? But we've got that document that we could send out to people. Yes, yes, no, that's fine. Uh, Tony, I believe, thanks, Tony, for your question. I believe you've asked a question about identification charts rather than books. I mean, books are great and they will obviously identify, but sometimes it's really nice to have a handy chart. I think the best one to carry around is actually to ask the Field Studies Council. If you just Google Field Studies Council and I identification charts, They've got a wonderful range of charts. They cover butterflies, moths, but also dragonflies, birds, reptiles, mammals. They're really fantastic. Uh, they're laminated, they're not too expensive, and uh, you, you'll find them really helpful to take around with you. Um, but other charts, if you go on the Cumbria Butterfly Conservation website, for example, and click on species, you'll see little potted summaries of all the Cumbrian species with a photograph. And if you click on the thumbnail photographs, uh, then you'll get a nice large picture. Uh, so that's just a handy guide for Cumbria. The other thing is we've just had big butterfly count. Sadly, it's just finished, where we had about 150,000 people across the UK recording butterflies and some day flying moths for a 15 minute period over the last two or three weeks and um, that comes with an id chart now if you google big butterfly count you might well still get that id chart coming up on your screen even though it's officially the count has officially ended and that will show you some of the more common species that we've been recording as part of this huge citizen science project uh, but the brief answer, Tony, is I would go for Cumbria Wildlife Trust, um, sorry, beg your pardon, Field Studies Council guides. That Those laminated guides that Field Studies Council do are really, really first class. Right, any more questions? Um, yeah, is there any hybridization between species? Yeah, good question again. Um, we've been asked if there is hybridized, hybridization between species. Um, the answer is surprisingly little, really. Uh, you know, when you see meadow browns, say, flying with gatekeepers, and gatekeepers look that, not that different. They look like smaller meadow browns with a little bit more orange. You sometimes think, well, perhaps they will hybridize. The answer is they very, very rarely do. Um, butterflies genetically have to be really very, very closely related. Um, and that does happen. So, for example, in, in Cumbria, we have northern brown argus, which I'll mention in my talk on the 31st of August. Um, and that's genetically very, very similar to the brown argus. Now, in Cumbria, we don't have any brown argus, so there's no hybridization. But in County Durham and in North Yorkshire, uh, the North Yorkshire moors, for example, um, both species exist side by side. And there is evidence of some hybridization. So that, that can take place where species are very closely related. I think the general rule is that actually it doesn't, unless they are genetically very similar. I mean, their, their um, sex genitalia will, would have to be able to work together. And nature is such that even species that are very, very similar usually have slightly different genitalia to the point where they would find it very difficult or impossible to mate. 
So I guess this is nature's way of trying to keep species separate. But having said that, you know, there, there is a little bit of hybridization. I think the, the thing that uh, is quite interesting is the aberrational side. You know, you can see butterflies that you think, well, that doesn't look like anything in textbook. And rather than a hybridization, it's, it's genetically uh, correct. But for some reason, and it could be, for example, the temperature that the pupa was under, when it emerges, and the temperature's been particularly cold or particularly warm, uh, then it can actually be of a slightly different uh, appearance with sometimes quite strikingly different markings. Uh, and that's not so much hybridization as, as an aberration. Right, any more questions? Uh, should we go with one more? One more, um, yep. When we cut our local wildflower meadow in September, do we risk killing butterfly eggs? Okay, yeah, good. Um, right, we just, the final question, a very interesting one to end on, uh, is that um, there's a, uh, one of our registrants who's saying that they, they have a lovely wildflower meadow, uh, but they cut it in September, and uh, does that actually risk damaging butterflies and moths? Uh, and the answer is probably yes, but there's a huge but, and that is it does far more good than harm. If it's a wildflower meadow, then it's really important it is cut, and I'm sure it, it's cut for uh, all sorts of reasons as to why it's important to cut that. But one reason that's beneficial to the ecosystem is that, of course, um, if it's cut after flowers have set seed, then a, a lot of the uh, meadow will be perhaps taken away as, uh, as silage, uh, as, as fodder, uh, for other purposes, it might be bailed up, it might be removed. If that organic material is removed, it will leave behind a lot of seed, so there'll be plenty of wildflowers to come through for the next generation, but you won't get a build-up of organic thatch on that field. That will keep the organic content low, which will keep the health of that uh, wildflower meadow going, and that will then benefit uh, our invertebrates, all our insects, the bees, the hoverflies, the butterflies, the moths will all benefit from that. And, and indeed, the whole food web, because obviously birds will take caterpillars, they'll take, sometimes they'll take moths, uh, take, they'll take uh, all sorts of insects at different stages. So a healthy wildflower meadow that's harvested after the flowers have set seed um, is good. Yes, you might lose a few eggs. Yes, you might lose a few caterpillars. But over the course of a year, it really is beneficial. Uh, so that's great. So thanks ever so much for all your fantastic questions. Um, I, hope, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. And I'd love to see as many of you back as possible on the 31st of August, when I'm going to be really concentrating on some of Cumbria's very special rare butterflies, because we do have a, a terrific number of national rarities and some of these can be seen uh, across Cumbria. Um, if you know where to go and you know what time to go, then you, you too can enjoy seeing some very special butterflies that won't otherwise come into your garden. But thanks ever so much, folks. It's been a, a pleasure to give this presentation. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Chris. Um, a big thank you from me at Cumbria Wildlife Trust. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, just a quick note to everybody that we've got a butterfly identification guide. So if you give me an email at lucyg at cumbriawildlifetrust.org.uk, that's lucyg at Cumbria Wildlife. I'm just typing it now into the chat, wildlifetrust.org.uk. Um, if you give me an email, I can send you a butterfly ID chart and um, please also look on the chat bar because you, there's a feedback form we'd like people to fill in, which enables us to do more presentations and events. So um, thank you, anyone, and that was an absolutely fantastic presentation. Thank you, Chris. Oh, thank really you. Enjoyed. So um, goodbye to everybody. I'll end the meeting now. Thank you, everyone. Well, I'll give you a minute to find my email address and feedback form, then I'll end the end the the meeting. Just give it a couple of minutes. Looks like people are leaving now, though.
Thank you, everyone, for coming. Bye. Lucy? Yeah, Chris? Um, are we able to have just a quick, quick talk? Yeah, go ahead. And I just, it was slightly strange because I couldn't see anyone's face and the, the sound that comes with the computer is really distorted. So I'm sitting here thinking, I hope it was okay. I, I, I couldn't really tell. Was, was, it, was it all right? People are saying, thank you, enjoyed the meeting. Thank you, that was excellent. Thank you, Chris. Oh, good. Yeah, no, it, was, it, was just, it was just very <laughs> weird because I, I couldn't actually see anybody. I couldn't see you and, and I couldn't hear anything apart from using Martin's telephone. That um, must be quite surreal. That's a bit weird. But if it, if it worked, that's great. Yeah. yeah, it did work. We had some good feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, hopefully try to get this sound business sorted out for the next one. Because yesterday it worked fine. Yeah, it's strange that it didn't work. Yeah, but anyway, there we go. These things happen. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, so let's um, switch on again about 20 minutes before we start next time. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks a lot for everything. All right. Thanks, Chris. It was brilliant. Thank you. Bye. 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 Do you, do you know if they could see you or not? I don't think they could. No. I think the problem is the same as your computer. It's that some people talk about oh, no. I think, you know, these new systems, Zoom, and brought up, yeah. designed by Whiskers, super powered computers. Yeah. You know, I'm on the smartphone, but I'm not computing power. Than I yeah. So I wonder if the wildlife trust can be back open by the face. I think we're something to have had skin of our teeth. Another thing here, we have a very poor internet connection. It goes down as I was probably And yeah. that do really like. I think the difference between now and yesterday is that for the 20 people or 60. Um, is, they said they said 60, I don't know how many. Remember 60 is the limit you can do. You know, when you've got when all these people join, yeah. Yeah, you've got all these people in at once and you could have all yeah. these faces. Too like, much pressure. I think it's just more than the process it can deal with. Yeah, that could be it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, it works. Yeah, no. Yeah, no well, they they asked some decent questions. Thanks, right? They did ask a good question. Yeah. I mean, I said to Lucy, it was really weird because I, I, I felt I was, you know, if I could see some faces oh, and yeah. people are sort of responding mm -hmm. yeah. or talking. Yeah, and just no all the time right. I felt like uh, I was just talking to a yeah, wall. I'd be all asleep. I felt, yeah, <laughs> is there anybody out there? Yeah. I could have been talking to myself. Yeah, you know, yeah. they could have all <laughs> switched up in these Well, exactly. It was yeah. really weird. Yeah. Um, but Lucy said no, they could see everything, they could hear mm. everything. And we don't know who they were, do we? Okay. Mm. Yeah. Um, my guess is there were a, a real mixture of folk because. Uh, some of the questions were very basic and some were really quite, you know, you'd have to know quite a bit about it. Yeah. So I think there was, you know, quite a cross section. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned the wider countryside. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, the question was, you know, it was why, why why is, it's a good question. Why is yeah. recording so uneven? Because everybody lives around Morecambe. Yeah. Because every, everybody lives around Morecambe. Yeah. Everybody lives in Kendall, Barrow, and Carlisle. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. Absolutely. I'll just. Copy that one I made onto your memory stick. I can't guarantee we'll be here on the 31st. We probably will, but we're going to have some sort of a holiday between now and the meeting.